beyond the, beyond the standard model, primarily in the form of supersymmetry. His work is focused on experimental signatures of BSM physics that could have evaded a decade of LHC searches. And we're gonna learn what all of this magic means tonight because I, I have no idea and I'm so excited for this presentation. He also has a project called the Kaleidoscope where music is created such that, wave, that the waveforms images of the LHC when piped into a two channel oscilloscope in XY mode. So Larry, I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, for your presentation and we're really excited to learn about physics this evening. Let's welcome Dr. Lawrence Lee. Thank, thank you so much uh, for, for having me. Um, so yes, uh, just to confirm, you can see the screen okay? Yes, we can. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, so yes, exactly. Uh, I'm a professor of physics uh, here at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Um, so I'm calling you right now from the be from beautiful Knoxville, which is in the, the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains. Of course, we have to be remote, but I do certainly hope that one day uh, that, that I can join you there in Grand Junction. Um, so today, exactly, uh, as you heard in that great introduction, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research. Um, so I've, and I've titled this presentation, uh, Exploring the Unknown with a Large Hadron Collider and Beyond. And I'll do my best to describe uh, what I mean by each of those things. So right off the bat, if I'm going to talk about the unknown, uh, I need to be able to change slides. Um, we have to define what's known before we can talk about what the unknown is. And, and, and this is a, a, an important uh, thing in, in physics and in particle physics uh, and really in science overall, this is really kind of the fundamental question in physics um, and arguably a really central question in human inquiry overall, right? And that is, what are we made of? What is the universe made of? What are humans made of? What is stuff? And over the last few hundred years, we've made really incredible strides in answering this question, right? If you think about it, at the beginning of the 19th century, um, we hadn't even yet shown that atoms exist, right? And, and today we have a really incredibly sophisticated understanding of how the microscopic world, how the subatomic world, how the, how the sub-subatomic world uh, uh, works. So to give you a feeling for that, um, we can start to think about uh, length scales. So if you look at the bottom of the screen, uh, this is a, a, a changing length scale here. So we started off at kind of a meter scale. So let's say human scale. And now we're at the scale of, of a human hair, which uh, is at roughly a hundred uh, micrometers or microns. But we can continue to zoom in and by the time you're looking at cells, you're at another order of magnitude down at something like 10 micrometers. And as you continue to zoom in, you get uh, access to the underlying proteins that are gonna be creating these fibers, uh, this kind of thing. And so now we get down to the tens of nanometer scale, to the nanometer scale, and you're starting to get into really tiny stuff. And as we do get down below the nanometer scale, which is where we are right now here, we start seeing those proteins. We start going down into the kind of chemistry level, into the kind of uh, uh, molecular level. And so you can see that there, uh, we, we're now dealing with kind of fundamental elements. And if you get down to this level, we're talking about the atomic level. So this is the familiar uh, uh, atom. And we have electron orbitals around describing where the electrons are in some sense. And if you zoom all the way into the very, very, very center of this atom, like really, really tiny compared to the size of the atom, you're gonna find the nucleus of that atom. And as we know from, from grade school chemistry, the nucleus is gonna be made up of protons and neutrons. And this is at uh, so uh, something like a femtobarn, uh, uh, sorry, a femtometer level, uh, or also called a Fermi. Uh, and so this is 10 to the minus 15 meters. The thing that you don't see so much in your science class necessarily is what's inside of these. Um, and so inside of the proton and inside of the neutron are these so-called quarks, 
And uh, to uh, some approximation, we can consider the proton made up of two so-called up quarks and one down quark. Um, these names up and down are, are, are purely names. Um, and, and if we look inside the proton, it's in fact uh, a mess of stuff. Yes, you have those quarks, but you have also uh, um, this, this kind of very dynamic uh, um, uh, environment uh, made up of, of uh, some other particles as well. So this is, this represents our current understanding of what stuff is made of. And, and this all fits into what we call the standard model uh, of particle physics. And so that is going to say that, you know, the periodic table of elements. Well, in particle physics, we have our own periodic table, and that's this here. Um, in the upper left, you have those quarks that I mentioned. And so while the proton and neutron are made up of up and down quarks, these U and D quarks, uh, there are some heavier cousins of these as well. Um, we also have this family of particles called the leptons, which include the very familiar electron, the electron we know and love. But again, also it has cousins that are uh, heavier, uh, and in this case, also cousins that are neutral, these so-called neutrinos at the bottom. Uh, all the way on the right, the standard model, as, as we're calling it here, um, uh, also includes um, descriptions of some fundamental forces. Uh, and that's what you can see there. Those, these are particles that are um, carrying these forces. And at the center of it all, we have, uh, of course, something that was very much in the news, uh, maybe now almost a year, uh, a decade ago, is uh, the Higgs boson, which of course was discovered in 2012 um, uh, at the Large Hadron Collider, which we'll say much more about in a second. Um, so in this periodic table, you might say, where do all of these things live in the atom? If we go further down into that atomic scale, where do these things live? And, and in fact, only a, some of these things do we ever actually have interaction with. Do, so, for example, like I said, uh, most atoms that we might uh, uh, interact with are going to be made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And that is to say, up quarks, down quarks, and electrons. So that's what tables and chairs and stuff and you and me are made of. All this other stuff is not really normally found in the atom. It can be, but usually not. Um, and um, but, but these are found in the universe, and they do exist in the laws of the universe. And many of them are unstable, so they decay very quickly. Not in any dangerous way. They just don't live for very long. And for many of them, if we want to see them and understand them, we have to produce them in a, a, in a very controlled environment in a laboratory. And that's exactly uh, what this uh, field of physics is for. So it, it's this. This slide, uh, this is what we study in particle physics. It's the particle content of the universe. Um, and, uh, and so I'm a particle physicist, and uh, these, these are my subjects, so to speak. So then, okay, that's what's known. That's our working model of, of how the universe works. Um, but what is the unknown then? What am I talking about in the title uh, about this unknown stuff? Uh, especially since I've said that we have a really sophisticated understanding of what's happening at, you know, what, what stuff is made of. Uh, what more is there? So the standard model, this picture, with all of these particles is really incredibly successful. It's arguably the most successful scientific theory in history, depending on how you, how you measure that. Um, but one way of quantifying that would be um, to say that a scientific theory is successful if it's able to predict the outcomes of new experiments. And the standard model is able to do that like none other um, with really incredible precision. Um, really, no other theory has ever been able to, 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 to match this. So for example, um, there's this property uh, of the electron. It's basically the question of uh, how much of a magnet is the electron. 
Um, and it's, the answer is not very much, but a little bit. And if you calculate with the standard model, uh, what that value should be, you get this number on the top, this predicted number. And if you go and you set up incredibly careful experiments, you can measure the value of this. And you can see within the experimental precision that we currently have, although I didn't write it on, on the slide here, um, the measured value agrees with the predicted value incredibly well. Right. So that means the math of the standard model was able to tell us what this number would be. We went out and we measured it and it matches super, super well, kind of a, to a part in a trillion level. Um, so that's incredible precision in, in quantitative science. Uh, it was also able to predict, for example, the discovery of a bunch of the particles uh, that I mentioned, um, which is to say, before their discoveries, we would look at the, the, the structure of the model and say, eh, it kind of looks like this needs to be here. And we go out and we look for it, and then we find it. And, and that's true for a bunch of these, uh, including, like I said, the Higgs boson, which was discovered in 2012. So that's overall to say that every single experimental test that we've uh, put the standard model up to, uh, it ha has agreed perfectly with it. And so in this way, it's an incredibly successful theory. Now, the thing is, while it's incredibly successful, it's incredibly unsatisfying. And I'll say a little bit about why that is, but it's essentially that while it's been an amazing success, there are some really major puzzles left in the standard model. So for example, these particles that we've talked about and, uh, and uh, this sophisticated understanding of the subatomic world and what stuff is made of and this kind of thing. It turns out, for example, that this, this model is only describing, it turns out, something like 5% of the universe. Something like 5% of the universe is made up of the particles at the top of the screen. And we've come up with that number which is unfortunately not 100%. Um, if you, for example, look up in the night sky uh, and you do some careful measurements uh, of, of, of uh, stuff in the sky with your telescopes, you can measure the existence of what's called dark matter. And in this uh, pretty picture of the night sky, uh, it's kind of this blue stuff there. It's not actually blue. This is uh, kind of uh, a, a way of representing the data. Um, but this is basically saying that there's a bunch of mass out there that we have no explanation for. It doesn't fit into the picture of the standard model. There's no way that it could be any of the standard model particles. But we can tell via gravitational effects that this stuff exists. So we have a problem there. And it turns out that's a quarter of the universe, 27% of the universe is made up of that stuff. And we have no idea what it is. Furthermore, um, we have uh, at the beginning of the universe, um, we have some big bang event. Uh, and the universe after some inflationary period is just uh, expanding. And in that very simple picture that we've all known for uh, quite a while, um, you would imagine if it's simply a, an explosion and stuff goes outwards, that the universe would, that uh, that movement would, would start to slow down. That's, however, not at all the case. Um, if you measure how quickly the universe is expanding, uh, that's actually accelerating quite a bit. So we're going faster and faster away in some sense. Um, and the thing is, we have no explanation for where that energy that that would take comes from. What is causing this accelerated expansion uh, of the universe? And this is something that's called dark energy. Uh, again, it's just a name for a thing that we don't really understand. So 95% of the universe is something that we have a name for that we don't really have a deep understanding of, and that doesn't fit into this model. So that's, that's, a, that's a problem with this. Um, 
another issue here is that the standard model, I, I mentioned before that uh, the standard model describes uh, three fundamental forces of nature. And that's all in these particles on the right side there. The issue is that there are four fundamental forces of nature uh, and the standard model is just missing one. And it's the one that's arguably most familiar um, or, or certainly one we can't forget. And that's gravity. The standard model doesn't include gravity at all. And so this is a major problem. Um, if we want this to be a theory that explains how the universe works, it has to account for this thing that we know is very real, gravity. Um, it turns out for subtle reasons um, that gravity, another problem is that gravity is something like 10 to the 17 times weaker than the other forces. So it really doesn't look like the other forces that are described by the standard model or the forces that are described by the standard model. So there's just some weird puzzles at play. And, and this is the kind of stuff that it drives us to keep looking to try to find answers um, in our current work. So that's all to say that the standard model really can't be the end of the story. Right, we're not done. We're so far from done um, because there really must be much more out there to discover. Um, and, and we just have to put in the work to, to try to do that. So what we do at the Large Hadron Collider um, is to look for new particles to be produced in high energy collisions. So that's to say, if we go back to the title slide, if we wanna do this exploring, of this unknown, we need a tool. We need an apparatus. And that is the Large Hadron Collider. So uh, our lab uh, is called CERN um, and it sits right outside of Geneva, Switzerland um, where I lived for the last 10 years. Um, and the apparatus that we use there at, uh, at CERN is called the Large Hadron Collider or the LHC for short. So it's a 27 kilometer uh, ring, the 27 kilometers around. Um, and, uh, and that houses a, a proton accelerator. Uh, that's to say that there are protons uh, accelerated in this uh, ring, both going clockwise and counterclockwise. Um, this whole thing sits uh, roughly a hundred meters underground. So we have to take a, a, a big elevator to go all the way down. And these beams of protons are brought to collide uh, with a record-breaking collision energy inside of four main experiments. And you can see listed uh, uh, here on the, on the slide. And these experiments consist of complex detectors, um, uh, chock full of uh, uh, kind of custom electronics, custom detectors, this kind of thing, um, uh, to look for the collision byproducts in, in these proton-proton collisions. So the, the kind of work uh, that I'm describing here is primarily done by these two experiments that sit at so-called point one and point five of the LHC. There are a total of eight points around the ring. Um, so at point one, there's uh, a detector called the Atlas experiment, which I actually was on for a very long time. And then uh, what I'm on right now is called the CMS experiment uh, at point five. These are very similar physics goals um, and uh, they kind of act as cross checks uh, of each other uh, in their results. So if we look at where this is situated, um, uh, this thing is, is enormous. Right here it is on a map, um, and you can see this um, this kind of purple line that cuts through this map. This is the um, uh, border between France and Switzerland. So you can see that the, the LHC is largely in France, um, uh, kind of by area, um, but uh, but CERN, the, the the main campus, is on the Swiss side, and so there's there's an interesting international uh, play there. Um, and the picture here on the right is a view from underground, right? This is the actual tunnel uh, in which there is a tube um, uh, with lots of, of complicated electronics and cryogenics um, that uh, house the, the machine itself, the actual accelerator. 
And this kind of research has a close historical connection with the museum. Uh, and I understand that uh, founder of the museum, John McConnell, who I think I saw on the line, uh, is a particle physicist by trade. Right? And, um, sorry. and particularly worked on an accelerator at Los Alamos uh, uh, National Lab in New Mexico that operated at an energy uh, in the units that we use in this field of 800 million electron volts or EV. And to give you a sense uh, for where the particle physics frontier uh, and high energy frontier has really gone to, um, the LHC today collides particles at an energy of 14 million million EV, right? So this is uh, 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 in fact, this is a Guinness uh, Book of World Record highest uh, energy accelerator uh, record here, uh, and so this is this is uh, kind of the state of the art of of the, this uh, uh, field of particle physics. And in fact, the LHC uh, holds many world records. Um, and including this one, which is kind of one of the loftier sounding ones. And it's that it's the biggest machine ever made. It's the biggest machine that humanity collectively has ever created. And, and that's um, uh, kind of insane to, to sit back and, and think about. And indeed it is huge. Uh, to give you another feeling for how big it is, if we put one end of the ring on the uh, Grand Junction airport runway, the other end of it extends beyond the other end of town, um, right? So this is really quite large. Again, it's 17, uh, it's 27 kilometers uh, in circumference and the whole thing is about hundred meters underground. So when we say large in the Large Hadron Collider, it is large. Um, while we're going through the name, I wanted to define what I mean by hadron. So the H in LHC, hadron, a hadron is a particle that is made up of quarks. So the proton, remember again, is a hadron that is made up of quarks. And the LHC uh, collides protons, therefore the LHC collides um, uh, hadrons. So it's a hadron collider and it's really large. The key thing in the name is really the collider portion of it. And so what happens is in this collider, in this animation here, uh, we're gonna speed along the tunnel, uh, crossing the French Swiss border, which is what those flags were. Uh, and then we're gonna follow a proton, again, with those kind of three quarks inside of it. Uh, and it's, it's accelerated to nearly the speed of light uh, coming into the experimental hall with another proton coming from the other side. At the very center of the detector, those will come and collide. And the collision byproducts will be measured by a complex system of detectors to come up with these particle trajectories. And it's with those particle trajectories that we can reconstruct, that we can use that information to deduce what happened in the microscopic interaction of those two protons. And so this is the, the fundamental work that we're doing is we just do this a whole lot and, uh, and, and look for events, look for these collision events to produce interesting and hopefully new things uh, uh, when, when we do this. So I work, uh, like I said, on the CMS collaboration uh, where particles come and collide in the center of the CMS detector, um, uh, which was shown there for a second. And this is what it looks like kind of in a blown up schematic. Um, so again, kind of um, uh, you have um, beams coming in from these kind of orange tubes on the side. Uh, and coming to collide in the very center of this. This is often described as a cylindrical onion in that it has uh, many layers of detector. Um, and, uh, and with all those layers, we are able to, um, to identify what kinds of particles they are, measure their properties, measure their momentum uh, and this kind of thing. And it's really using this technique that we were able to find more than half of the standard models particles. So this has been an incredibly successful paradigm for how to discover new things. Like I said, this thing is huge and you can see in the foreground, there's a, there's a little, there's a, there's a person 
uh, you can see for scale. And, uh, and to give you a sense of this, uh, it's something like 15 meters tall, a little under 50 feet tall, and in length, a little under 100 feet. So this thing is enormous. And in fact, if you compare uh, its weight to that of the Eiffel Tower, it's significantly heavier. Uh, it's something like 14,000 metric tons. Uh, and if you compare that to the Eiffel Tower, that, 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 the Eiffel Tower is only like 10,000. This thing has um, something like 80 million detector elements whose job it is to take a picture of the collision, like a 3D uh, picture of, of the collision using custom electronics, custom computing, uh, a whole lot of custom uh, placement of screws. And, and with that, we, we learn about the universe. The collisions uh, of the LHC happen about every 25 nanoseconds. Um, and if you do the math, and that's something like 40, well, it's exactly 40 million times per second. So people often will say, ah, these detectors, it's like you have um, uh, 80 million channels. So it's like a 80 megapixel camera, which doesn't actually sound that impressive, right? I mean, I, I have like a 20 megapixel camera in front of me. Um, so it's not like we're just gluing four of those together and, and we get this. Um, the, the really interesting thing is, can your camera take 40 million pictures a second? That's the thing that is really special about, about this thing. Um, we've been taking data with these detectors since about 2009. Uh, and so we have more than a decade of uh, experience working on these things and collecting data and, and really making discoveries and doing a lot of measurements with this. Um, this is huge though, in many, many, many ways. Uh, including uh, in the size of the collaboration that it takes to make this thing work. So here is a small portion of the CMS collaboration as of 2017 uh, in the building that sits uh, above ground, um, uh, above the CMS detector, uh, along with, um, I believe, a two-scale uh, poster thing uh, of CMS on the wall there. The CMS, uh, the CMS collaboration is, is really what makes the experiment tick. Um, uh, we don't need to get into it unless there are questions about this, but CMS uh, stands for the compact muon solenoid, and I'm happy to, to talk about why it's called that uh, if you want. Um, and it contains something like 4,000 uh, particle physicists, engineers, computer scientists, technicians, students. Uh, there's a whole lot of expertise that's needed to make this thing work. And that's from around 200 institutes and universities from more than 40 countries. So this is a really incredibly big science. It's a huge collaboration uh, and, and really a very uh, international, a really worldwide collaboration. The LHC has been operating uh, since 2009, like I, like I mentioned, with the first kind of physics results coming out in, in 2010. And there has been exactly one major discovery, and that is the Higgs boson. And for sure, we were always hoping to have a whole lot more discoveries than that by now. So we have, unfortunately, no new insight into the problems of the dark matter, the dark energy, how gravity fits into this picture, this kind of thing. We have been searching like crazy to try to understand this stuff. Um, and we have certainly set a lot of constraints on various models that could help us understand these things. But we've had no positive understanding, right? We have not discovered the answer. We've only excluded wrong answers right now. So this makes us incredibly sad. And we're trying to figure out exactly how to handle this situation. What are we going to do to help answer these questions? What can we do left? Could these new particles that might exist to explain these things have been hiding from us in some way? Uh, what mechanisms are, are there for that? But in general, the question in the field is, what do we do now? Like, what, what's next? I'm looking for a decade for these answers, and we can't find those answers for some reason. 
And one important direction for the future is actually based on something that Einstein told us. Einstein, of course, said this equals mc squared. Um, what does that mean, right? C is just the speed of light. So the speed of light squared is, this is just a constant. So this is just a way of saying, if you want more mass, you need more energy, right? It's just equating mass and energy. So the LHC, like I mentioned before, is at this kind of 13 to 14 million million electron volts, uh, which is also known as, let's say, 14 TeV, tera electron volts. But what happens if the universe, if nature, has given us these new particles that would help explain all those mysteries, but they're just too heavy? Say the answer is sit at 20 TeV then we just can't produce them with the LHC. And there's not much that we can say about that if that just happens to be the card we've been dealt. So that's to say, if you want more mass, if you want access to more mass, then you just need more energy. And the problem with that is that if you need more energy, you need a bigger machine. And just to remind you, this is the scale of the LHC, it's huge. Um, but if we want to go further, so there's a proposal on the table um, and a lot of work uh, going towards realizing this project, um, which has a, a kind of a bad current code name, but it's called the FCC for the Future Circular Collider. Of course, that name won't last. If it's actually produced, it won't be future at some point. We hope it'll be the present circular collider. Um, and instead of a 14 TeV machine, this would reach 100 TeV. And in order, to, in order to do that, this would have to be significantly larger. And it would have to be something like 100 kilometers around. So this is now the beyond of my presentation title. <laughs> this is really far beyond. And in fact, if the F FCC is built, it will use the LHC as, as a stepping stone uh, pre-accelerator, as it's called, uh, just as a tool to get to this uh, much larger energy. You can see the size is enormous and, uh, and, and it's so big that if you zoom out to the scale of Colorado, it, it's huge, right? This is the kind of thing where you, know, you easily see from space, right? This kind of thing. Um, uh, much smaller uh, accelerators can be seen from a space. So this, that's not a, a great metric, but it's huge. <laughs> and, and the thing is the time scale for this thing is that it'll start in something like 2040 to 2050, something like that, with data analysis continuing all the way into the 22nd century. Right, so our, our work is getting to the point where it's starting to go beyond the scale, beyond the time scale of a single person's career, or for that matter, a single person's life. So this is, this is a, a new level of, of, of big science. And with that, you can imagine, comes a really huge price tag. So the estimates for building the FCC are at something like 15 billion dollars. The LHC, uh, very roughly, depending on how you count it, people often say something like 5 billion it took to build the LHC. For the FCC, it'll take about 15, maybe 20 billion dollars to do this. So wait a minute, that's, that's a crazy amount of money that we're talking about, right? Like, that's a lot of cash. 15 billion dollars. Yeah. The thing is, this is really big science and it costs a lot of money. And as a result, this is not the kind of thing we can actually do with private funding, right? There, there's no uh, super rich nonprofit who can make $15 billion happen, right? That's just, that doesn't exist. Um, so that's to say that this work is quite political. It's not political, of course, in the sense of red states versus blue states or anything like that. It's really political in the sense of it has to do with states, meaning countries, right? This is about countries and involves collaborations between scientists and governments worldwide. 
So in some sense, it's incredibly beautiful that the world as a whole has decided to come together and collaborate to build the largest machine ever built by humans, right? So this is funded by governments, by government research programs. And that is to say that this kind of work is taxpayer funded, right? So that's, that, that, that means that it's, it's you guys. You're the ones helping to make this happen. It's all of us. And as a result, from within the field, it's our responsibility to give back and successfully communicate to you what it is that we're doing. So I'm, for example, so happy to have this time uh, with you to, to tell you a bit about what we do uh, with, with that support. And with that mission in mind, um, uh, as mentioned in the beginning, in, in 2019, I started a, a music project, a kind of outreach music project. Uh, and in this, I use old electronics from particle physics experiments, um, such as this uh, so-called oscilloscope, um, to make music under the name Kaleidoscope. And in this music, uh, I'll show you a little bit of this uh, in, in a few minutes, uh, the sounds are engineered such that the audio waveforms themselves draw pictures from the world of particle physics. And, and, and it's really that these pictures are encoded in the actual audio waves that you're hearing. So what I did is I started running around CERN um, and just found old electronics basically in the trash more or less and started tearing those apart and hacking them into instruments. Uh, so, for example, you can see some pieces here from uh, from major experiments of the past. Uh, and in fact, this thing that says SSC is a, uh, I don't know if anyone happens to remember this, but this is a major cancellation in the U.S. Um, uh, but in any case, there's a piece of trash that I took from it <laughs> um, and have turned into an instrument uh, um, for making music. Uh, and this one here, uh, this, this experiment at the top is actually a Nobel Prize winning experiment that helped discover the, that, that did discover the W and Z bosons um, that I didn't mention, but I flashed on the screen. I've taken a piece of that and, and turned uh, that into a, an instrument for me. And so what I did is I, I then took this stuff on the road and I started playing live shows where uh, I demonstrate the, the physics of music, the physics of CERN, electronics, um, but all in the context of a live electronic music performance, right? doing something quite different from the more traditional kind of uh, uh, science outreach, which involves giving talks like the one I'm giving right now, um, but instead just kind of doing it on the dance floor, right? Just having, having there be music and, and the injection of excitement for science um, uh, uh, in that environment. So I've uh, had performances or features at music festivals in the UK, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Denmark, um, shows in Switzerland, Sweden, the US, uh, and, and it's been a, a really great uh, experience um, uh, until COVID uh, came along and shut down uh, that, <laughs> the, the world of live music. Um, but before that, um, so for example, this is a, a, a little uh, clip from um, from a music festival in Slovakia that I played. Um, so you can see that my like stage set up here where I have traditional electronic music instruments, but also vintage oscilloscopes around. Uh, and then also this kind of repurposed electronics uh, uh, from the particle uh, uh, physics world um, used as, as supplemental uh, instruments. And you, you're gonna see a green line on the screen. And that is going to be uh, directly off of an oscilloscope, the measured waveform of the sound you're going to hear. Okay. And the picture that you're going to see, I'll just go ahead and play it. This is actually the shape of the Large Hadron Collider. And in general, in this music, I encode pictures from our experiments uh, into the, the audio waveform. emitted by every geek, dork, and four eyes. I call it Poindextrose. 
And so this is kind of the idea. You have a whole set where you're simultaneously um, showing the audience how audio works, how, how sound processing works, um, uh, but then also how uh, elements of particle phys physics. And then of course, but first and foremost, they're just having a good time on the dance floor. Uh, this is picked up uh, by various uh, press outlets throughout Europe. Um, uh, even in, in kind of the COVID times, uh, this is a, a performance. You can see that I'm wearing a mask here. Um, that happened in the CERN control center. So these are the actual control desks um, that operate the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, and uh, we'd set up a nice um, uh, live set that happened from there uh, that was then simulcast to a really cool uh, club in Prague. Uh, and then this is like a, a, a pretty fun, th this was actually in March, 2020. <laughs> so this was right before everything started to, to lock down. Um, but this was in a basement club in, in Sweden. That was a, a fantastic time. I really love this project um, and I do hope you check it out. It's called Kaleidoscope. It brings me a lot of joy um, to inject just enthusiasm from the public for particle physics, for physics, for science, for STEM, for STEAM, if you add the A for art. Um, and, and that's all because it's really crucial, again, like I, like I said, that we have you, the public, with us, right? Coming along this journey with us, that you understand what it is that we're doing and why it is that we're doing it. Um, so to me, this is what makes institutes uh, such as Eureka so important to science, right? We're all trying to learn as much as we can about our world uh, and to share that wealth of knowledge with, uh, with our communities. Um, and I hope that you leave this event with a, a little more knowledge, a little more excitement, a little more curiosity about the world of particle physics uh, and, and physics. Um, if you want to see some more, check out the project, uh, this musical project at CERN.ch slash Kaleidoscope. And you can see more information about our work in general at CERN.ch. There's a lot of great resources there. Um, also my website at CERN.ch slash Larry. Uh, and in general, I just want to thank you for your attention. And, uh, and of course, thank you so much for your support of this great museum as well. Thanks. And we'll open it up to a few questions, Larry, if you have a few more minutes, people yes, of course. may have sparked some curiosity out there. I think that we're going to allow everyone to now be able to unmute themselves. There's a comment in the comment bar from Christine just saying that she followed the Kaleidoscope on Instagram and it's super cool. And thanks so much for sharing your time with us. Oh, nice. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of there's there's a lot of videos of some live sets and stuff in there. And uh, it's just kind of fun. I'm going to put John McConnell on the spot. I know that he's on the call this evening. And John, um, if you be so kind, I'm going to unmute you. Would you like to say a hello to Larry and the group this evening? John? Do you hear me now? We do, yes, good evening. Hello and thank you. It's nice, nice to sort of meet you here across electronics world. Uh, interesting to see some things going on at CERN. Uh, last time I was in CERN was about in the 1970s. So those tunnels with the uh, accelerator in uh, look quite familiar. And nice, yeah. That that would have been before LEP, right? Yeah, I mean LEP was built in the nineties, right, or in the eighties. Yeah, it was. It's a good time back. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. But you're you're uh, putting stuff together and making music and waveforms. That's fascinating. I like the looks of that. 
Thank yeah, you. It's, it's it's a it's a cool project. Thank you very much. And and uh, and and uh, you might know it uh, more as as uh, the more technical term that I use is uh, Lisa Zhu music, uh, in reference to Lisa Zhu figures. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. Those kind of figures you do when you start thinking about to use them in a cell school. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you for coming and and giving a fine presentation tonight. Thank you for having me. It's great to great to, to talk to you. And we have a question in the chat um, from Lauren. She's curious how and when your interest in science of physics <laughs> began. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, it, it was kind of on and off for a long time, actually. Uh, I, I really very much liked uh, a lot of other stuff. And it wasn't until kind of late in college that um, I, I found a real, uh, I, I found that physics kind of agreed with me. <laughs> uh, and and I, I put aside the other interests in some sense, including music. Um, and, uh, and it's largely because I, at the time, didn't know that you could do physics as a job and it was very practical and uh at some point i started to learn that it could be a career doing research and, and that kind of really changed everything i was always interested in kind of the fundamental and kind of these kind of curious philosophical questions about you know what what stuff is and what uh what makes up the universe but uh to eventually learn that that doesn't just need to be um, curiosities and can actually be a thing that you can have as a profession really kind of changed everything for me. Well, that's a great intro to the next question. Um, someone wanted to know if a high schooler were interested in this as a career, what would they, what would you tell a high school guidance counselor how to send them in the right direction to be a particle physicist? It's a great question. Um, I think, uh, honestly, yeah. um, at the high school yeah. level, the thing that you want to do <laughs> is learn some technical skills. Um, and, and this goes throughout all of STEM. This is useful, but that is to say how to effectively use a computer for scientific reasons. Um, uh, learning electronics, learning programming, this kind of stuff. These are foundational things that are that are kind of bedrock in in uh, in the world of doing research. Uh, and then once it, you know somebody is in college, then it's finding research opportunities and getting involved in um, in in uh, in a lab. Yeah, that's really that's really the 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 way to go about doing that. And and the only way to have success doing that is really to have those those kind of technical skills um, ready to go. And so I, I think that's uh, some of the best preparation uh, <laughs> you can do for, for this kind of thing. And then there's another uh, question from Trisha. Could you explain the purpose of the CMS? Sure. Uh, so, so the idea um, in CMS is to collect as much data as possible from these collisions of these protons. Um, then the nice thing about CMS is that it's, it's what we'll call a, a general purpose detector. We just collide the protons and then uh, collect as much data and then figure out how we want to analyze that data later to come up with um, conclusions about the universe. Um, so that's to say it's, it's just kind of, it really is just a picture, uh, a camera taking all these pictures. The ultimate goal of that data analysis is to study the particles that we already know about and have already found, um, and hopefully to find new particles that we uh, have never seen before. And that would hopefully help answer some of these, these mysteries of the standard model. So there's another interesting question. What is security like around the tunnel? And maybe also at CERN? <laughs> yeah, um, so 
at CERN, uh, there's kind of a normal security setup um, in that, you know, there's just guards at the, at the entrances and you have to show a badge and this kind of thing, um, which is not so different from, uh, for example, the national labs here in the US. Um, so, so here in Knoxville, we're about a half an hour away from Oak Ridge National Lab um, that I just went to a couple of days ago and it felt very similar. Um, the tunnel is significantly higher security um uh, and any of these kind of experimental science um it is one of the coolest things i've ever done <laughs> is to have opened a door with my retina um and and so there is that kind of level of of uh of security going on um but a funny story is i don't know if you guys have um uh, if you're familiar with uh, Angels and Demons, uh, the Dan Brown book, which has um, uh, some portion of it happens at CERN. And in the book, a, a major uh, plot point is that they have these retina scanners to, that allow you to, to gain access to the tunnels and stuff. And uh, and somebody, there's an eye that comes out. It's, it's gross. Um, but um, at the time, Stern didn't actually have these retina scanners. And uh, and then this book came out and Stern was like, oh man, we have to uh, live up to the public's expectation of how cool it is here. And so then they had to install uh, these retina scanners. So um, yeah, that's the weird order that that went in. Fascinating. Um, then there was another question from one of our interns at Eureka. Um, were you able to learn the language and culture while you were in Switzerland? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so I lived in Switzerland for about 10 years um, and only just recently moved back to the States. Uh, so um, much of my adult life was spent there. Um, does my French uh, show it? No, not at all. Um, <laughs> I, I speak some very poor French, um, uh, but certainly culturally it had, a, it had a big impact on me. And um, yeah, certainly I, I can't get the wine and cheese that I could there uh, here in Knoxville, unfortunately. Um, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Great. Um, and then another question from Lauren. How long did it take to build the LCHC and how long is it estimated to take to build the future CC? Yeah, that's that's a great question that I wish I actually had the numbers for. Um, so basically, the discussions for the LHC really started uh, in kind of design uh, in, in the early 90s, something like that. Um, and then... Uh, uh, construction basically happened uh, uh, kind of in the mid 2000s and then was completed or maybe early 2000s until the, the late 2000s uh, until it all started up in 2009. So it took quite a while um, and it's a big, uh, big construction feat. Um, and you can imagine it's, it's just very large. Um, also, one of the things that we do when we build these things is we make assumptions about future technologies. Um, because if you build something with your technology that you have today, by the time it's actually built in many decades, that's really old technology. So we have to project into the future a bit. Um, so that makes some of these things a little awkward. So for the, for the FCC, um, that is projected to start data taking in the 2040s and probably it'll need to be, um, the, the construction would need to start something like a decade before that. Wow, oh, great. We have another question that just came in. Uh, why is the LHC underground? Why does it have to be in the earth? That's a really good question. So, um, the answer is it doesn't. <laughs> um, the uh, the the uh, it's kind of interesting. So so its predecessor, the the last um, accelerator that 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 was also colliding protons, uh, 
or actually protons and antiprotons, was actually here in the US. Um, uh, this is called the Tevatron at Fermilab outside of Chicago. And that was only a little underground. It really wasn't underground. It was just kind of at, at, at ground level. Um, and that was fine. And you could have done the same for the LHC in principle. Um, the reason it's underground is because it is actually sitting in a tunnel that was built for a previous accelerator. So this is the, the hint is, or the trick is that the LHC is not the largest accelerator ever built. It's actually tied with the largest because the other one sat in exactly the same tunnel. Um, and that accelerator wasn't for protons, it was for electrons. And electrons are different. And for that machine, if you have electrons and you're, you're, you're spinning electrons around in a ring, there will be radiation effects. And so for that machine, that had to be buried deep underground for those radiation effects. Um, but for protons, that is not needed at all. Um, but it was a practical consideration since the tunnel was already built, saved a whole lot of money. You didn't have to dig a new tunnel. Interesting. Well, thanks so much for your time, Larry. Yeah, of I, course. This is I'm really fascinating. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm really uh, happy to, to, to share this with you. And a huge thanks out there to everybody who logged in tonight to learn and engage with us. We appreciate you. We hope that um, you continue to support the Eureka with your time and resources and your smiles. We love seeing each one of you come through the door and greet us. We thank John McConnell for starting this so many years ago and that his legacy is living on in the Eureka today. And we hope that the collision of physics and STEAM and learning is occurring here. And we're excited for what 22, 2022 will bring uh, to the Eureka, all the youth in our community. And I wish everyone the best. Thank you again for a great evening and have a good night.